Thank you, Eric. Thank you, uh, uh, to the Queen for organizing this talk. I'm uh, happy to have a chance to talk to you for a few minutes about uh, privacy and security. I'd like to make a couple of uh, introductory points. First of all, this is not a new discussion. We've been thinking about uh, security and privacy and sovereignty for as long as we've been living together as communities. Many of us are here tonight because we're worried about the privacy implications of 251. But what does privacy mean anymore anyway? Here's your quote for you. You already have zero privacy, so get over it. <laughs> Who said it and when? 1999. Before social media, before the explosion and digitalization of everything, it was Scott McNally, he, he was the CEO of Sun Microsoft. You have already, in 1999, already you have no security, but there's no privacy. Get over it. <laughs> so things have changed a lot since 1999. The world we live in now is just so digitalized, and every transaction, you know this, but every transaction you make, every chat you have, every image you capture and send, it's there forever. Like it's there, it's digitalized. And people are watching it, are analyzing it, and are using it. And you know that from the ads that keep popping up on your screen. Like people are watching what you're doing when you click on the mouse. So privacy is under enormous threat, not just from the technology, but the technology has all kinds of other implications. And from our government, and the threats in 251 that Donald and Elizabeth will talk about in detail are very real. But regrettably, I can tell you also, from our court system, the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada in December about cell phones, which essentially, I have the utmost respect for the justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, but I don't think they all use lost smartphones. And I don't think they understand that your smartphone, with all of it, Please, if they get you, if they pick you up now and then, you always go to a walk, okay? Um, they can search your contacts, your chat, your emails, everything you have on your phone. And lots of people are carrying on their whole lives on their phones, and more and more people are going to be doing it all the time. It's a set of So there's great threats to, to our, our property. Um, and, and, I guess the big point is that technology is not only eroding our privacy, but it's really forcing us to reconsider what we mean by that. It means something different today for somebody who was grown up with a digital rights tax 24-7 than for somebody who wasn't brought up. It's it, it, it changed. It's an important thing. The second point I want to make, the big point I want to make, is that the nature of the threats that we're facing with respect to security are, of course, changing. IT, the, IT the, the, the threats that are brought on by the fact that we are connected are very real. I mentioned some things like child luring online. In part of the problem, it didn't exist before we were online. Now it's a real threat to security of our person that our states have to find ways to deal with effectively. So the nature of the threat has changed quite dramatically also. And states exist, if they exist for any reason, is to protect us. Protect us from whatever the threats are and the threats, which include trying to, to, to defraud an elderly person by getting over their visa account number or, 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 or whatever kinds of frauds that, are, that take place in our interconnected world are real. And states have to protect us. Um, the third point I'd like to make is that we can't deal with any of these kinds of threats in isolation. Canada cannot be the goal for us. By definition, the things we are talking about are things that exist because we are interconnected and, and, and dealing with the, with the world in which, you know, where are you when you're in cyberspace? Who, who commits a crime? How, how do you collect the rules of evidence? What are the rules of evidence? How do you prosecute? All these kinds of questions are being dealt with. But you can't deal with them in isolation. And unfortunately, under the present 
being in Canada, we kind of managed to isolate ourselves pretty well, uh, at least uh, in terms of our ability to act internationally. The, to make progress on these types of issues that we're here to think about tonight, you really have to try and develop a, a more common understanding. And that is one of the reasons I'm so delighted to be here on this stage and honored to be on this stage with Elizabeth May. From early flagging of the real threat represented by P51 has given the whole nation pause. Given uh, the NDP pause, and, 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 and I, 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 I've no doubt that Elizabeth's early principled and persuasive arguments against C51 um, have given us all reason to start thinking about just hang on, why are we doing this, and why are we doing it so quickly? Why are we doing it in this context? We had to build 236 after all of that, I would say. And there was a whole range of these. What the, what the, the way that, that those first measures were put in place was with a lot more consultation, a lot more awareness, all kinds of provisions, sunset clause. What's being proposed here to appear tonight is, is, uh, goes much further and has real, real, real risk to all. I, I'm going to close there. I just want to say thank you again. I want to say thank you to Elizabeth for standing up on this cause on my own personal behalf. Uh, I want to thank her for the principal position she takes on so many issues uh, and the integrity she brings to politics. She's given me faith in politicians and it's kind of a hard thing to be looking for uh, reasons to have faith in politicians to live in our country. So thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> and, and thank you for